Good, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the first of our spring term uh, Friday seminars. And I'm especially happy to welcome uh, Ben Schneiderman, who is a friend of long standing. I think we were looking at our uh, history, and I think we've known each other for close to 35 years. Mm -hmm. I guess we must have met in high school or something. <laughs> um, Ben's been around in the field since the beginning of, of human computer interaction, and he's clearly one of the pioneers, and he is responsible for many of the you know, important developments in the field. I think what's interesting about his career is that not only has he contributed enormously himself, but he's always been a cheerleader for other work going on. And uh, we've, we've benefited from some of his good cheer, as have many, many others. He also established uh, an, important, an early and important lab at the University of Maryland, which is still thriving and has produced many, uh, a lot of good research and a lot of good students who've come through that lab. And uh, he should have a lot of pride in, in that creation. Um, he's published a lot uh, in many different areas. Uh, I especially like the work he's done in information visualization, and I was able to convince him to come to my class yesterday where he uh, regaled the students with work on tree maps and related topics. We also yesterday opened up an ex exhibition down on the fifth floor of his tree map art. And I encourage you, all, especially we'll have the reception down there after the talk, and you can look at some of that, and he may even describe a few pieces for you. But that, uh, that exhibition will be up at least through the middle of June and uh, maybe even longer. And uh, we're delighted to have, have the opportunity to put it up. Also, he's uh, been writing assiduously recently. We just learned the other day that he has completed the sixth edition of his influential uh, textbook on human computer interaction. I guess it's a sign of our field's maturity that a book can go through six editions. And uh, so we'll all look forward to seeing that. And also, he just published this book called The New ABCs of Research. And I'm especially delighted that that's the topic of his talk today. So, Ben. Thank you, Gary. Here we go. As you all know, Mr. Gary and for Judy, a little bit of a souvenir of the book. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it, it is a pleasure to be here, to be back here, and to speaking to so many dear colleagues who work I know and appreciate and uh, build on. And it's great, Judy and Gary especially have been dear colleagues for many years. Uh, today, um, it's a special and different kind of talk for me. I mean, most of the time, I, well, my, my, let's say my background goes to working on database and file design, optimization techniques, and the standard kind of computer science. And then I became this 30% of an experimental psychologist in trying to study the ways uh, that people use technology and the way to design them more effectively. And now I'm sort of proud to say I'm maybe 5% of a sociologist <laughs> trying to study the way social media work. And especially now we're working on electronic health records. And so my technical talks are about analyzing streams of patient histories where you have point events of, of, of surgeries or heart attacks and intervals where you have medications or hospitalizations and looking for the patterns of treatment that lead to happier outcomes. And that kind of work is going in interesting ways. Take a look at event flow. Uh, one word online, you'll find a, a rich body. There's 40 or 50 groups that are using our software and we continue to uh, do that work. But this work is a special personal project that builds on a lifetime, I would say, of, of Thinking. People ask, how long did it take to write the book? And I say, you know, 40 years. Uh, <laughs> but it's kind of, uh, it's taken me three or four years. My wife, Jenny Priest, many of you may know her work as well, wisely said, take your time with this book. And indeed, it has been a special effort to focus on what are the lessons I took away from my career, what are the ways in which research has changed from when I was trained to the days now. And so that's the story I want to tell you here. And it's become an important calling for me. And this book uh, functions in two ways. Uh, first is it's a guide for junior researchers and students about how to conduct work in the current research ecosystem in a way that you will achieve high impact. And we'll get into a long discussion of what do we mean by high impact. But whatever it is that you want to achieve, I hope I give lessons for how to do better at it. The second aspect of this book and the larger, longer term vision is how are we going to change the research ecosystem 
for the future so as to achieve the new set of goals necessary in the context of the new tools that are available and in the context of the changing mental set, the ambitions and the expectations we have for research. So that's the story. Um, that's where we're going. And I start here by saying that I was trained in an era which was greatly influenced by the work of Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's science advisor. And in 1945, as the Second World War was coming to an end, he wrote a very influential manifesto called Science, the Endless Frontier. And in this important uh, book, it's free online, you can get it, he describes what's come to be known as the linear model of research. You start with basic, pure, fundamental research, and then you go to applied research, and then you go to developing products and services, and then you put out this commercial organization to manage and operate this large system. It's a lovely model. It's very simple. It's very clear. Unfortunately, it's just not true. It doesn't really work. I saw you nodding. Yes, oh, that sounds right. I've heard this before. Of course you start with basic research. That's why we call it basic research. And then, of course, we do applied research. And in fact, it's institutionalized in the US government's funding. The Defense Department has 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. Each of the stages manifested in law and in budgets based on what Vannevar Bush said in 1945. Now, he was operating at a time when he was promising his physicist friends who he had pulled from their comfortable homes and university jobs to Los Alamos, New Mexico, to build the bomb. And in two years, a little more than two years, they did this remarkable piece of what I would say is applied research. And they developed the bomb. They had a driving problem. And they succeeded. And they also did a lot of really good basic research along the way. Okay, And even in that story, which is kind of ironic because that's, you know, Bush's big legacy was to have run or initiated the Manhattan Project, we have a contradiction to his proposed view of the world. And in fact, if you read this manifesto carefully, you'll find that he alternates chapters where he describes the remarkable medical advances brought by researchers during World War II because they were challenged to fight tropical diseases and deal with injuries and deal with new technologies. And once again, these driving problems produced fundamental basic research that was highly valuable. Okay, And so we're at odds. If you think about it deeply, you'll see that the linear model is just not strongly held and doesn't prevail in so many of the circumstances. Now, others have pointed out these failures and suggested an alternate view. Famously, Donald Stokes' book, Pasteur's Quadrant, a University of Michigan professor. <laughs> and his book, Pasteur's Quadrant, describes Louis Pasteur, who worked on the problems of fermentation of wine, the failures of them, and the the de decay or rotting of milk. Um, and he came up with pasteurization and vaccinations and ways to make wine more reliably uh, productive. And he worked with farmers to test his ideas and develop the germ theory of disease, a basic research breakthrough. Now, academics are actually very smart people. The only problem is they don't know how to choose the right kind of problems. Okay. And so this book tries to make a case for a new model of how research might be done so as to be more productive. That's the pitch I'm after. My goal today is rather ambitious. I'm here not to tell you what I've done. I'm here to change your way of thinking and working. So this is a fairly short talk, and I'll invite questions along the way. And I, I've come to see that in doing these talks that having you engage and challenge this is a, probably a better way to get you to rethink your existing models. Now that rethinking, for those of you who are involved in administering departments or funding agencies or corporate relationships, there's one set of lessons. And the questions and, and the lessons for students are also there. I want you to think differently. How might those who 
set up academic programs, instill more of the agenda that I've got here, such as teamwork? How might we have more integration of science, engineering, and design? How might you instill applied and basic as the, the working agenda? Okay, that's where we're going. Any questions so far? <laughs> Any challenges? Good, all right, let's go. So my suggestion is there are three things that have changed that make the world very different now than it was when I was studying. Okay, the first is the immense problems of the 21st century are of a different nature than the ones of the 19th or 20th century. Okay, we have a large base of knowledge, of science, of engineering, of design that's in place already, and now our dilemma, our challenges, are mostly socio-technical in nature. It's not so much understanding medical processes, although more needs to be done, but it's healthcare delivery. Two trillion dollar industry of in, to raise the quality of healthcare. It's sustainable energy. It's environmental and climate control. It's community safety. One after another, these are large problems, so-called wicked problems, that are very difficult to study, don't fit the traditional scientific method of reductionist approaches, laboratory studies in small ways. And that the ascendant technologies and research methods will be ones that address these large-scale problems and deal with more interventions in vivo in the real world of problem solving. So that's where we're going. The problems have changed, but the good news, don't be afraid, because the new technologies have brought us powerful tools, especially the web, social media, social communications tools, collaboration technologies, okay, visual communications as well, whether it's visualizations or visual communications and video online, YouTube, etc. These have dramatically changed the power of researchers to be able to find previous work, find collaborators, develop working plans, form teams more effectively, carry out research, disseminate the results. <coughs> and so those new technologies, the social media equally, have changed the game. 30 years ago, typical researcher read 175 papers a year. And they read them from paper journals that they got <coughs> six or eight they subscribed to, and they read from those small number of journals. Now, Typical researchers read 400 papers a year, and those come from social media recommendations. Emails from colleagues, listservs, blogs, websites, and other sources that bring to them the references, the links, and which they then go out to, and they read from a much more diverse set of journal sources and even disciplinary sources. The game has changed, the power has changed, but there's some pretty good news here if you keep up with this agenda. Okay, the third difference is the raised ambition. Teams now and researchers are doing much more than they used to. 20 years ago, a typical medical study would involve one hospital, 800 patients, three years of study. Okay, now a typical paper might have eight universities or hospitals around the world, 10,000 students, uh, 10,000 uh, patients or participants in these studies for longer terms, more intensely studied with more variables and more data being collected and analyzed. So there's much larger projects being done than had previously been the case, okay? And also it's translated by the increased expectation of the funders, whether they be government agencies, whether they be research professors, whether they be the, um, uh, the corporate partners who participate in it. There's a greater expectation of what's going to happen in a six-month or a year or three-year research project. And that really forces us to deliver a lot more. The lazy days of a relaxed research project over six years, collecting data and finding an understanding of a situation have given way to a much greater pressured accelerated pace where the payoffs are expected to be sooner and larger. So that's a bit daunting, but again, I think the strategies that have moved, have emerged, are making that possible. All right, so if you come along with me that these are the context issues that matter, I say we need two guiding principles. The first one is the ABC principle, that's the title of the book, 
okay? Applied and basic combined. It used to be that we said we do basic research first and then we do applied maybe, maybe different people do applied. But now, I'm saying you'll do better basic research if you work on an applied problem. So my model is you bring your theories and basic research outlook to an applied problem with partners that are, have a real practical problem. You take your theories, you instantiate it and test it in the living laboratory of the real world. You come back and you refine your theories. You publish your theories for general dissemination and you, do, and you put out your solutions for specific problems. And that avoids the difficulty of pure basic research going nowhere because it doesn't have an application. It reduces the difficulties of translational or technology transfer, which is terribly fraught and rarely and only occasionally succeeds, we'll say. And it also avoids the problem of those who do only applied research, who don't have a way of generalizing their results to other domains, don't deal with the publication environment. Now, Donald Stokes anticipated these quadrants as well. In addition to the Pasteur quadrant, he describes the Edison quadrant, an admirable quadrant. Edison had 1,060 patents. Okay, pretty admirable. But he never wrote many papers. He wasn't concerned about the science and the generalization. He was only developing products. So it's something to be done there, but better if you can get both. Okay. The other quadrant is Niels Bohr, who had only theoretical foundations, didn't seek applications, and produced important results as well. So I don't want to exclude those, but I'm recommending to you, if you want high impact in both, you'll do better to follow Pasteur. Okay, now you could challenge me, and I say there's always room for the lone tinkerer who's got an applied instinct, and there's always a room for the solitary theorist who's got something going on here. But if you're drawing on my tax dollars, I'm looking for you to produce high impact in shorter amount of time. Okay? So I'm sort of leaning this way. I don't want to give up on anything, but I'm saying applied and basic produces better results in both. Having a driving problem, having a real situation, and somebody who cares about the results outside the laboratory and gives you a working environment where you can test potentially will give you better results in both domains. Now, this is a further reason you need teams. It may not be possible for one person to do all these things. So you might have to form partnerships or larger teams. Okay, second principle. I told you I was trained in an era of science. And the influential book was Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, 1962. Okay. Science in those days was research. The National Academy of Sciences was founded in anybody? 1863, Abraham Lincoln. Okay. And at that time, science was all the knowledge arts. But the National Academy of Engineering was founded in 1964 only. Okay. So only at that point did engineering become a research discipline. And the National Academy of Design was founded in? Good. It was a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I sort of, in the book, advocate for 2064. I've come to see that the method of science, scientific method, is still valuable. Controlled experiments and laboratories, reductionist model, good idea. but. It has its limitations. We all know the flaws of medical randomized clinical trials. They don't always really work and represent reality. Engineering methods have yet other attractions and allures. The modular design of engineering, the systems thinking of engineering, the prototyping and the scaling up are very strong parts of the way engineers get new knowledge and do research. Do they cross over? Often, yes. Do scientists become engineers? Do engineers become scientists? Yes. The more controversial and newer kid on the block is design or design thinking, which in the last 20 years has emerged dramatically as a new way of acquiring knowledge. It's not a matter of making a brochure or designing your landscape, but design thinking is a way of gathering new knowledge. And the methods of design thinking are sufficiently different that I think we should be educating our students, and you as students should be studying design thinking 
as well as engineering thinking, as well as scientific thinking. All three of them have their virtues. And I make a strong advocacy that we learn all three of them. Okay? So that's the second principle, and that's a further reason we need teams, because these are different skills for the moment. Maybe eventually everybody will be trained in all these methods. But right now, design thinking is still a fresh idea. Engineers would say design is part of engineering, and sometimes it is. Ship design uh, would be, or structural engineering design are parts of engineering. But landscape design, brochure design, social design, these are kind of areas that engineers don't usually go too deeply into. And so I'm saying there's another way of thinking out there, and if you want to be strong research leader for the coming decades, you might strengthen yourself in each of these areas. Okay, here's a little bit of evidence. Early on while I was working on this book, the Google Ngram viewer, you may try this, it's, all, it's 20 million books in English, and they go back from 1900 to 2000. And you can look for the frequency of different words. So if you look, you can see engineering during the 20th century wiggled around, it grew a little more important. Science wiggled around, but look what happened here. Design suddenly, in 1975, maybe not suddenly, but became the dominant subject of discussion in the books of Eng English books during that century. I saw this, I thought that was pretty interesting, but as a single data point, I was not ready to bet the, the farm on this one. And so I sort of looked at this for a while and tried to consider as I was writing the book whether to include it or not. And then two years ago, the New York Times came out with their chronicle tool on their New York Times lab, which lets you search all the New York Times articles. And I did that. And look what I found. Scientist wiggles around, engineer wiggles around during the 20th century, but design in 1975 crosses over. Well, two data points is pretty strong. <laughs> so they got into the book. These figures are both in, early in the book, and make the case that design is actually more powerful, more prevalent than I had realized. And it wasn't just Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive that made this happen. There's a growing movement that design was becoming a vital part of our culture. Now, many companies have recognized this and have design teams, design thinking. The Harvard Business Review celebrates design thinking. The uh, IBM, in its celebration of Watson and so on, now has 25 design studios around the world in order to work with customers to integrate Watson into business processes. Because design thinking turns out to be different from engineering and different from science. And they came to recognize that pretty early. So I became an increasing advocate in this book for raising the prominence of design and design thinking in our, in our, in our work. OK, so here's where we are. We've got the context. We've got two guiding principles. And now, if you follow me down the book, there's five chapters. And uh, the five chapters talk about these five issues about reframing uh, the research agenda. First is how to choose problems. And I say choose them with civic, business, and global partners. Read the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 powerful ideas that would be important. Read the National Academy of Engineering's 14 grand challenges. Read the Bill and Melinda Gates agenda of the problems that need to be solved. Take a look around at what people are saying are the important problems. Find yourself partners then with local companies. University of Michigan actually is doing a lot of this, of working with local, not local companies, but local um, uh, governments, city and state governments. Work with those. I think in California you have the Citrus model, an admirable one, which is uh, four universities of the California system that are working together on problems for the state of California. $200 million investment to create partnerships and work on real problems, like issues like engineering professors from Berkeley are working on measuring the snowpack in the Sierra and Nevada so as to know what the status will be of water, better measurements. So it's kind of a good engineering problem, a good basic research set of issues, and a practical benefit for the citizens of the state. Uh, Ken Goldberg at Berkeley is working on the California report cards. Citizens get to vote about how well the state of California is doing its job. Okay, so interesting issues there. 
Um, then the methods of research, this one was an interesting chapter of how we've gone from only from traditional observation and controlled experiments to include interventions at scale in the real world. After all, when the era of A-B testing, ideas that began with Amazon and Netflix and Microsoft matured, Microsoft runs about 200 A-B tests every day. These are tests at scale on the web with real users where they might change some aspect of the web presentation. When Amazon was doing it, they would change the size of the picture of the books or the amount of text that's shown. And in a few days of running these real tests with hundreds of thousands of users, you'll know what produces better sales or not. Okay? And moving into these realistic environments of testing, Ron Kahabi's work is maybe most admirable in here, has pursued this for a long time, but this presents us with an interesting alternative or complement, let's say, to the laboratory studies and controlled studies that have been the traditional approach. I think we're seeing that the potential for the online data collection is so um, entrancing and the whole big data movement is built on the potentiality of getting more than just survey questionnaires or interviews. We of course want to balance with ethnographic methods. I'm looking at Bonnie and others here. We want to make sure you get those and that's I guess in the, uh, this part here. Um, but these multiple methods I think are very effective and it goes with the raised ambition. It's not enough just to collect big data or not enough to do just ethnographic. Do them both and show me that you get similar results from these two. <coughs> Triangulate. Okay? And I, I, I find that a very powerful argument. I was very influenced by um, Richard Yeh's book, The Case Study Method in, so, in, in Social Sciences, is that right? case study. But it's one of the most referenced books in Google Scholar, uh, all top 10 books you know, of all time. But it's a great book that it changed my mind because he made the powerful claim. Remember, I was trained as a physicist, as controlled experiments. And he says that case studies Repeated case studies do more than collect ideas for hypothesis testing. They provide evidence of the validity of hypotheses. That was a big jump for me. And I came to be an enthusiast of that model. Okay, we'll go deeper into the forming teams, and that's kind of the biggest chapter with the most references and the most help from Judy uh, <laughs> and others. Uh, and then the, the, this chapter on testing the ideas, prototyping, realistic interventions, we'll talk about ethnographic methods, big data methods, and the strengths and weaknesses of all of those. So that's a further methods chapter. And then I think people find the most interesting one because it's the most <coughs> actionable one, is how do you promote adoption of your own work? What's the best way as a researcher to get impact and make your work resonate and spread and disseminate. Uh, well, if we have time, we can talk about those ideas, but they're pretty compelling. There's a few fun ideas there that people seem to like. And then, of course, once you've done all that, how do you get to assess impact? And the goal is what I call the twin win. You get solutions to real problems, and you get better theories. Okay. Take a little pause here, just to see if you want to challenge me so far, or ask any questions. Thank you, Judy. So in the yellow or in the orange column there, I don't see where you're going to start developing theories. I see all the things that lead to solutions, but I don't see the theories. Fair enough. I don't highlight it over here. You're, you're right. Uh, it's intimately tied in over here. So that chapter uh, talks about it. And I do have a kind of taxonomy of theories. You may have heard this before, but there are descriptive theories. There are explanatory theories. There are predictive theories and prescriptive theories, and the last minor categorical generative theories. So I think a better understanding of the kind of theories we have is really important. What's a theory anyway? Uh, that's another one to wrestle with. Uh, uh, you know, it's a sort of big issue. Maybe I just say another word. Descriptive theories are really naming and identifying taxonomies of words and, and, and verbs, nouns and verbs to describe a situation. Explanatory are more cause and effect. If you do this, you'll get more of that. Uh, or we see if you change the pressure, you increase the temperature, OK? You know, the P P1, V1 over T1, right? OK. And the 
Predictive theories are what we think of mostly, which is that they predict outcomes usually in a numeric way. And that's the current fascination with machine learning for predictive analytics. Okay? There's a growing area which we're active in called prescriptive analytics that says use your data not only to make predictions but to make prescriptions. That is, in the medical case, you've got a patient who has got this kind of heart disease and so on. Take a look at the 600,000 patients who have had this disease, similar age, gender, etc., and from that, make a prescription of what we don't just predict they're going to have a heart attack in six weeks or six months but tell me prescriptively what to do whether you should have surgery or whether you should have other treatments okay so i think those are the four kinds of theory generative theory are larger theories like um, uh, the periodic table of elements okay it's a theory about how things emerge and it will lead to further prediction so it's kind of larger framework, but those are kind of rare, okay? So that's theory. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Maybe I'm reading these uh, yellow-orange boxes in sequence and I shouldn't be, but the, <laughs> the, 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 and tell me if that's wrong. Um, the second one you talk about in intervention, and then again in the fourth yes. box there you talk yeah. about intervention, yeah. is, is the idea related to what you were talking about, coming up with a theory and then working with yeah. some people that then test it, is that? Exactly, exactly. These, this is meant to be chronological. You were right okay. to read it this way. This is how you choose a problem, then you're going to form your research plan according to these historical, this takes me all the way back to Aristotle and Francis Bacon and Galileo and so on and up through Popper and et cetera about the theories of how you, you know, collect data for evidence testing. I found that really interesting. I was surprised at how shallow or how much I learned about the distinction between what Aristotle did and what Galileo did and Bacon and, you know, the movement through those things, Ronald Fisher, et cetera. Uh, this is getting down to business. We'll talk more about that because I think that's what this crew is about. And then once you've got your data, now how do you, or it's, you're right that these two could be tied very nicely. Uh, <clears throat> I think of this more about <coughs> data analysis once you've done your, your work. And then here is, this one's clearly the end game here. It also talks a lot about, a growing section of that was how to write papers. Uh, it turns out there's very nice evidence about writing the best thing you can do to promote your research is to write about it well and most papers are not written well <clears throat> and there's some very nice evidence as well as guidelines for how to write scientific papers with a story a beginning middle and an end a sort of issue a question will it be this way or will it be that way and then a resolution that says it's this way you know and this kind of trajectory of Shakespearean plays, not quite, but that's one kind of plan for writing. Hey, Gary. Um, so <clears throat> I think you may have teams in the wrong spot. Oh, okay. They should be at the beginning. I you can need see teams that. to figure out what actual problems are. That's <coughs> fair. That's fair. Okay, I can see that. All right. Uh, one more? Yeah. Oh, Gloria. <laughs> you and Alfred have to negotiate which one. <laughs> Go ahead, Gloria. So, so the um, choosing the actionable. Problems. I mean, that's great, but funding agencies have a big mm. role in determining what are actionable yes. problems to be funded. Correct. So we, you know, in a sense, we are constrained by what funding agents determine. And yes, okay. And I mean, I'm teaching a class about how to pick problems now. And go to the NSF website, for example, or NIH or others, look at the current programs, look what they identify as the problems. You're probably going to do better to do something in the scope of what they've done. Okay? And you may perceive that as kind of a deus, you know, this sort of given enforced thing. But I see those programs as the result of the community's discussion that I've had input to those. You probably had some input in some workshops and NSF forming ideas, the CRA getting, and the communities developing ideas. NSF doesn't just pull these out of a hat. Maybe DARPA pulls them out of a hat, you might think, that DARPA has an agenda of its own, which is, I, I would agree, somewhat stronger by their perceived notions and they're stronger in enforcing, but I think NSF and NIH are more driven imperfectly by what the community's will is. 
So these are larger processes that you may engage with, and you're right, not everyone engages, not everyone knows about them, but they are, NSF makes, I would say, a sincere effort to build on community values and expectations in terms of its program. I'll give Alfred the last uh, short question. Uh, what should we do with disciplines that do not directly contribute to uh. actionable problems? Okay. Like history, archaeology. Yes. Fair, fair. Uh, I, I, I make a strong point in the book that the scope of my attention is science, engineering, social sciences, design. I, I don't go to mathematics and philosophy. I don't go to religion, history, humanities, and other things. So those, those seem to be an important boundary for me. I couldn't go all the way to those things. So they have somewhat different agendas, fine arts as well. I don't think they're driven as much by having impact and dealing with the immense problems of the 21st century. Now, I'm a great fan of humanity studies. I do think it enriches people, and not just one writing course and one history course, but I think all engineers, researchers need a broad and diverse background uh, to understand the problems of our world and to make those wise choices. So yes, I believe those, but that's one of the scoping uh, features of the book. Okay, so let me dive in for the remaining time. We can take a couple of these. Oh, oh, there's the summary. That's the, the book story here. Um, and I'm just going to go into this, uh, uh, the, the teamwork issue. And, you know, the question becomes, how do you form teams with diverse individuals and organizations? So, first of all, the argument for teams. This is the now famous work of uh, Brian Uzi and uh, Wupti and Jones at Northwestern University, uh, and this was a very highly cited paper in science, which took the 18 million papers available to them in the web of science, and over this period of time, uh, they showed that the mean size of teams went from about you know under two to over to three and a half in the science and engineering, somewhat slower growth in social sciences and arts and humanities as well. Okay, um, and. The remarkable story is, even 50 years ago, having multiple authors actually produced higher impact as measured by science citation counts. Okay? It was about 70% higher if you had up to five authors. Okay? So you got, instead of just uh, you know, 100 citations, you got 170. Now, Cynic said, jumped up and said, well, that's because they have more authors and they cite themselves in future papers. <laughs> and in fact, they, they anticipate that. And they say 10 or 15% of the effect is that way. So collecting people who will go. But even discounting that, it turned out to be 50 years ago, 70% benefit in working together in a team. Now, why might that be? OK, Judy's probably got a long paragraph about that. But basically, working in a team gives you more capabilities, diverse thinking, collaborations of all kinds. There's many reasons you might argue that a team, and I'll come to some of them uh, you know, shortly. I would say, though, I would like to stress the very powerful aspect of a team. This came up in some of my discussions with students and others today. The moment where you say to your team members, you know, I've got an idea. Why don't we do da 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 Voicing for someone else to understand what you intend to do is extremely powerful. Because their research partners will say, what? What do you mean? I don't understand that. Why would we do that? And that kind of pushback and exchange, to me, is probably the heart of teamwork. OK? Yes, you have diverse skills and diverse perspectives. But the benefit of diverse perspective is diverse questions and refinement and clarification of what the research is about. In fact, I will tie it very strongly to the writing process. You used to say, you first you get your research idea, then you do your research and write it up. No. The, the, the very much shifting mood is get your research idea, then write it up, and then do the research. You might say, how could you possibly do that? I do that with my students who come to me, want to do a semester project or work with me. I, I say, before I do this, I want you to write one page. Tell me what you're going to do. Give me the title of the paper you're going to write. Give me a little schedule of what you're going to do, first, second, third, or first month, second month, third month. And forcing them to write the title of the paper they will publish at the end is a very powerful feature. Okay. 
So that kind of so so in the book I write that writing begets clear thinking. Now you may think that clear thinking begets clear writing, but I'm saying the other way. Forcing you to write or speak in public or present your ideas forces you to make a clarification of your plans and therefore gets you to do better work. Right? I'm seeing nodding supportive faces. But I want to encourage this instantiation of it. In my discussion with some of you, we talked about the strategies of having presentations by students and faculty to colleagues about the work they're going to do, not completed projects. We're used to presenting completed work, but much better to present work that's planned over the next semester or next year. Okay. So uh, there's also an interesting phenomena here. In the humanities, you can see a slow growth here. But it turns out, even in the humanities, team-written papers, rather than single-author papers, have much higher science citation incomes. OK? Yeah, science citation counts. Now, the further compelling issue is that even in their initial data, which only goes up to 2000, so still kind of early days of the web, the difference between 2000 and 1960s is that teamwork in 2000 produced an advantage of 2.1 rather than 1.3, 2.4 instead of 1.7. Now what do you think is it that makes teamwork more effective in 2000 than it was in, in 1960? Yes. The speed of communication. OK. The web, the communication, the collaboration tools, the collaboration readiness, the collaboration technologies that make teamwork more successful. And not only the technology, but the fluency that people have in collaborating. They've learned how to do teamwork better. They've been part of more teams. They've worked it out, and they've got the better methods going. OK, this data is updated in the recent report that I will strongly recommend in a few moments. But you can see science and engineering has now gone to 90% of the papers are co-authored, are teams. OK, and the same thing, a sharper bend in the social science world, okay, which is moving to catch up. This is very different from the old days. Okay? Look how different things are here. So the movement towards teams is strong, and I want to encourage you to learn how to work in a team. And I would say an important principle is you should have your own role in the team and should clarify what it is. And when I have a group of students, I like to see them working on the same area, like the electronic health records, but each student, my job is to make sure each student has their own role and their own task and their own PhD and their own papers that they will be first author on. The others may join in and help out. But the point is to work together to build lots of good papers. And that benefits everyone in the team. OK, so the book has separate sections about each of these things. How do you form teams? And again, Judy and Gary are experts on these kind of issues. And one of the results shows that a good idea is choose people who have worked on previously successful collaborations. Sarah Kiesler, her student Jonathan Cummings, and others have also found this kind of result. Balanced teams, there's a tricky word. But I'm a big fan of watching who's in the team. Do you have young and old, a very important combination. Maybe not young and old, but junior and senior researchers. Okay? Working as a junior person, working with a successful senior person is a very good strategy for you to take. Men and women together. Women are different from men. Okay? And they work in different ways. Not always. Okay? Each person. <laughs> but there's a predilection for collaboration and strategies that is very positive that women bring to research teams. Not always to their benefit. It's sometimes a struggle for women in research teams. And there are many dangers for women joining teams that are largely men, but balanced teams are better for women as well. Okay? And, you know, that, well, I don't want to go too deep. There's a lot of hot topics under the gender and teamwork. Collaboration readiness are they ready and eager to work on teams, or are they, are they saying, like many computer science, I mean, I, computer science, I'm one of them, you know, has the highest degree of introversion of any uh, discipline that's studied? And our instinct is to work on by our own and solve a problem on our own. And yet, other disciplines have an instinct and a readiness and an eagerness to work together. Why? Because teamwork is fun. Okay, now I know teamwork, you probably had painful teamwork experiences. And I can see the grimaces around the room. That, but 
in the best cases, it's so much fun. If you read Kahneman's book, uh, you know, Thinking Fast and Slow, he celebrates for about two pages how much fun it was to work with Tversky. Okay? If you read um, the Double Helix, um, Watson and Crick, Watson just celebrates how much fun it was to work with Crick, who was such a clever guy and how they went to the Eagle pub in, in, in you know, Cambridge to uh, have their lunches and wear that table. I've been to that table. They came up with the idea uh, for the DNA structure. OK, technology ready is for remote teamwork. Technology readiness for collaboration. Uh, again, these Judy and Gary identify in their book, and I follow them down this road. And trained, experienced leadership where possible. Now, that's a little tricky, is leadership you don't want too strong a leader who dominates. You want quite equal discussion, but you want a sensitive, thoughtful leader who knows how to manage a group and who's aware of balanced participation. Groups where everyone has to speak are really good. Some groups install the idea that you cannot speak a second time till everyone in the room has spoken. Another strategy I've seen is that you do not leave the meeting till everyone in the room stands up and says, I agree with the plan. You stand up and say, I agree with the plan. If you have hesitation or you don't agree, you need to talk about it. But too many groups have people who are quiet. They go along even though they don't understand it or they don't like it. And that's not a good form. Remember, teamwork is not all happy and fun. Contentious teams are good as long as they get resolved. Okay? I've been working for 28 years with Catherine Plaisant. We have more than 90 papers where we've been co-authors. We don't agree. We often argue. But I know whenever she speaks up and disagrees with me, I am going to listen to what she says. Okay? And that works very well for us. Okay. The second set of issues about managing the teams, clearly defined goals and roles. Everybody knows what they're doing. They know where they're going. Everybody's aligned with that idea, and they've all said, I agree with the plan. Okay? Then, explicit statement of who does what by when. In my classes, when you, there are team projects, Susan says, I will deliver a prototype by 6 p.m. on Tuesday. John says, I will give you my feedback by Wednesday at noon. Hour by hour commitments like that build trust. You start with little commitments. You show that it works, you come back, and you build bigger trust and bigger efforts. Okay? Good communication, again, a whole lifetime of learning of what that means. Regular and open discussions, use of effective brainstorming strategies, as again, a whole literature on that. And then for larger teams, beyond 10, you need some pretty strong administrative resources and services. Uh, for that, I turn to this excellent book. Judy was a player in getting this done, but it's authored by Nancy Cook and Margaret Hilton. Uh, that describes the enhancing the effectiveness of team science. Free to download from the National Academy's website. They're hot big seller. They've got tens of thousands of downloads for this yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, it shows there. It's listed far more than any other publication. But in this past year that it's been out, it's a huge story. And it has a lot of, it's well written, you know, it's really well written, well documented, lots of resources, thoughtful organization as well. I really like this book. And although I use a somewhat different framework, I like their seven categories of how, you know, teamwork proceeds and how uh, smaller teams between two and ten are very different. And the traditional teamwork is focused on small teams with homogeneity and you know, align the goals. The harder job for management, as well as research, this book is a big call for research in this area to study how to do these larger and more difficult teams. Okay? All right, my instantiation of this in the, is this project I call, uh, the, the, way, the way I do teamwork in my classes, and people like this, so I've repeated this, of, of you know, each project should have two parents and three children. And the two parents are, there's a theory, and there's a practical issue that you care about. You take your theory, you test it in the practical world, you come back and refine your theory, and you get the twin win. And the outcomes are refined theories, practical solutions, and 
guidance for the next generation of researchers who take on this problem. Okay? And that's the way my students write their final reports. They better make sure they have a section called, you know, what's the theory, what's the practical problem, and then how have they refined theory and what kind of practical solutions. And that's been a very effective classroom teaching mechanism, but I, I draw on that for my research things as well. All right. Um, I think we're sort of running out of time, so I don't want to go too much further. I may say one or more. Let me pause about teamwork and any questions about that or challenges. Yes, thank you. A quick one, I hope. Um, you, you mentioned a, a long collaboration you'd had with Catherine, I think you said. Um, and then you talked about leadership. How do you, when you've worked with somebody for such a long time, how do you decide who's going to lead the what projects do you, think? you do? <laughs> Without a flip a coin, take turns, Never, turn. never came up. Uh, it's quite fluid. I mean, she's a senior research scientist. She's very smart and capable. We're very complementary in our personalities. I'm kind of the outside person who's running around giving talks like this one. Uh, she's really good in just getting down to work. We meet every week, Thursdays, with the students, and we talk about the plans and where we're going. She tends to be focused more on working with the particular case studies and with the students. I'm out there thinking big things, and I'm the one who says, you know, we ought to write a paper about this, that, and the other. And then we get together and do it, and she often produces really wonderful insights to the paper that my outline just missed a lot of things. So it's ne we've never had the discussion of who's in charge, okay. but we always, it goes quite fluidly. The students know they, can, they get the benefit of turning to both of us. She is on, she's chosen, she's not a faculty member. She's a research scientist, and for 28 years she's been supported on the soft money funding that we've gotten together. We write grants together. We follow through, we talk a lot, we laugh a lot, we eat chocolate, and you know, sometimes we don't see each other for weeks. And just a short email exchange, and she picks up when I'm not there, I pick up when she's not there. We've all had our sicknesses, and we've had our family problems, and other dilemmas, and we just jump in to help each other. So it's that kind of psychological safety, if you saw this Duhig, Charles Duhigg article, where there's a great trust. We're not personal friends outside of work too much. We don't get together on weekends very rarely. Um, but, you know, we just work together in a very good way. But we talk to each other quite honestly about our medical problems, family problems, or other, other issues. And we know we're going to get help. But we don't, we don't lean each other on uh, as, as we might friends or family. So it's a very special kind of relationship that is, I'm happy to, you know, happy to. It's been a benefit to both of us. Helpful, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yes? Uh, when you referring to the balanced in the team, yeah. uh, I suppose uh, what you're saying is the key is about the mixture of different thinking style. That too, style. yes, right. So there's many balances. I said a senior researcher and a junior researcher, men and women, thinking style. Yeah, it's very woman, helpful. It's yeah, you may get this, this correlation. So one style, one issue that's important is a one team member who says, look, we got to get this done for the conference submission on April 3rd. Mm -hmm. Okay? Whatever we do, let's get it done for April 3rd. And the other person says, you know, I'm here for quality. I don't care how long it takes. I want this to be an excellent paper. I don't care how long it takes. And somewhere, both of them are right and both of them are wrong. And that kind of tension reminds you of both directions. Can you get quality and speed? That's what you want. And by having someone advocate for these different principles, you're more likely to think about getting both. So we're sort of past the stage where you want, do you want A or B? The answer for most of these questions is we want A and B. And our ambition, the technology and the tools make it more possible than ever to get it. I can't resist one or two things. There's sort of one idea here that people like, how to promote adoption. I think I'm going to, oh, all right, I'll just leave this here. And just tell one story, and we want to end promptly at four, I think you said. So um, I talked about writing. Now, promoting adoption, there's many strategies. The best things you can do are to get out there and present your work and talk about it to other people, OK? So go to the leading centers of research, present your work, and make connections with leaders in the field. Very important. Now, here's a simple strategy called Send Five and Thrive. And this idea sort of 
works pretty well and has a sort of a fresh idea. It reframes your thinking. So here it is. You finished your paper. It's been reviewed by reviewers. You've been asked to revise your paper for final submission in two weeks. You do that work. Now you have a pretty final draft of the paper. And I tell my students, OK, go to the paper, look through the references, and find the five people that are most influential to your work and most strongest leaders in the area you're doing your project, your, your paper in. Get their email addresses. Send them an email note individually, five personal emails. And you write, Dear Professor XYZ, I am a graduate student at the University of Maryland working with, I'm a graduate student at the University of California Irvine working with Gary Olson. <laughs> and I'm doing research on this and that that draws heavily on your work. We have two questions for you. Our, our paper is to be submitted in 10 days, and we have two questions for you. One, have we been fair in describing your contribution to this research area? Secondly, have you written anything more recently that we should be citing in this paper? OK? I will make you a bet that you get 80% response in 20, 48 hours. OK? And the students are kind of intimidated, you maybe too, about, do I write to this professor at Harvard or Shanghai or, or, or in, in Oxford? I say, yes. You are a graduate student at the University of California, Irvine. You're working with Gary and Judy Olson. Of course you should be speaking to the leaders in the world, OK? You should. You should think of that image of yourself as a professional researcher in this large community. Now, when you realize that you're saying, have we been fair in describing your work, you suddenly run to the paper and you see that it says, you know, Professor ABC's work fails to do X, Y, Z, to, to do this, to do that, one, two, three. Our paper corrects this omission. Well, suddenly you get scared because you realize you can't send that, that paper. But remember, it's so easy to change your outlook on the world and to say, you know, Professor ABC's pioneering work can be fruitfully extended <laughs> by the work in this paper. Okay? It just makes you aware that you are a member of a community and you should be say, playing nice with people. It's the instinct of many junior researchers to make negative statements about other work to show how good they are. But you don't have to do that. And that's the kind of thinking I want to change. I want you to think that you're part of a community, that you're doing important work, that your work can change the world, can have an impact, can advance the theory and make practical solutions that lead to better life for many people. Okay? So I'm going to close here and just say this is the closing message. The ABCs of research is about a basic, applied and basic combined. It's about achieving breakthrough collaborations. It's about analysis based on creativity. It's about actively building connections. Networking is really important. And it's about asking bigger questions, okay? <laughs> so that's kind of a, a little way of thinking about this problem. There's some readings there, and I guess that's the end of the story. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>
and that the U.S. government may have kept with the idea too long should not vitiate the great contribution. I, I'm sorry if I was too harsh on, on Vannevar Bush. I'm a great fan. His biography is quite informative. I spoke with his biographer, Pascal Zachary, Zachary Pascal, um, about why uh, he thought Vannevar Bush wrote this. And he said he felt that Vannevar Bush was giving payback to all his physicist friends who left their comfortable homes, went to Los Alamos, which in those days was not very pretty, uh, and, and you know they did their job for the country, and he promised when you go back, you'll have unfettered research funding for what you, whatever you want to do. And we've lived in that trajectory, and the physicists have done much and continue to do much, but I would say I'm asking for a change in our underlying philosophy for the research agenda and how the National Science Foundation, National Science Board, the President's Council of Advisors on Science Technology do their work. As I said at the beginning, it's a great talk. My only concern is that some of the younger people here, having seen just that one component, okay. don't realize the extent to which they are here because of what he was able to do. That's, I, 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 I share most of what yes. you're saying to, to, I'm, I'm sympathetic. Just to echo Steve for a, a second, he also was responsible for the establishment of the National Science Foundation, yes. which yes. has been a big part of all of our lives. Right. Right. He right. actually wanted to be called the National Research Foundation. Yeah. Okay. And so those issues of science, engineering, design, and what is the scope of research are really central issues. Thank you again. Thank okay. you for your challenges. Let's um, <laughs> uh, thank Ben yep. one more time.